Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. John Danaher. He's a senior lecturer in the law school at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Dr. Danner's research focuses on the ethical, legal, and social implications of new technologies. He maintains a blog called Philosophical Disquisitions and produces a podcast with the same title. He also writes for the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies and is the author of a recent book, Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work. So, John, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, thank you for having me as a guest on the show. Okay, great. So, I mean, in your book, you go through four different propositions, uh, all of them having to do, I guess, with some sort of... I mean, the first two have to do with automation, the second two have to do with two different types of utopia. But uh, I guess that a running theme there throughout your book is the one of human obsolescence. So uh, could you tell us what human obsolescence means in this context? Yeah, sure. I mean, like a dictionary definition of the concept would be something like, uh, the state of no longer being useful or used. So when you talk about human obsolescence, you're talking about humans no longer being useful in some way. Now, like I threw that in in the book as the opening chapter, and I I, th I have a quite a strong statement in the opening paragraph where I say like human obsolescence is imminent and the future is one in which humans are going to be less relevant to things. And you know that's. A, there's a certain amount of like rhetorical hyperbole in that um, paragraph. And the way in which I flesh it out in the first chapter is I focus on obsolescence in different arenas of activity, initially different forms of work. So I look at human obsolescence in agriculture, manufacturing, finance, the professions like law and medicine, um, services industry. So a lot, a lot of it is focused on obsolescence in work, and then I also talk a little bit about obsolescence in government, in the process or business of governing people, and also obsolescence in scientific uh, inquiry. Um, another thing that I don't discuss in that chapter, which I could possibly have discussed, although I'm more skeptical about it, is human obsolescence in artistic creativity. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So so I'm I'm focusing on like specific forms of, of human obsolescence, and what I'm appealing to in all cases is the notion of machines being better at performing certain tasks than humans. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the first proposition that has to do with the automation of work and you say that it's both possible and desirable, I guess that one important thing to talk about here is that when we think about the ethics of labor or work ethics, I mean, this is something that hasn't existed always in human history. I mean, it's a somewhat recent thing, probably dating back to the uh, 19th century or something like that, probably uh, gaining more weight in human society with the with the advent of industrialization am i right or or not um, so like i i would say you are correct i mean there are people who might dispute whether work is a, a recent invention mm -hmm. and uh, you know the part of the problem is here is there's lots of people lots of definitions or understandings of what work is you can have like very wide-ranging definitions of work where it's just any kind of physical activity and if you go by that definition humans have always been working and they always will work. But I think the notion of a form of work that is rewarded economically and then the economic rewards are used for the purposes of buying and purchasing goods and services that help you to survive, that form of work is a modern invention, probably dating largely from the origins of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's the kind of work that you are criticizing in the book and that you say that we should strive to end, if possible, via automation. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this might be one of the the tricky things about the book conceptually. I don't, like I, I appreciate like I, I've discussed this topic with many people over the years, and we always get hung up initially on this definition or understanding of work. And when I when I talk about the automation of work, usually people instantly disagree with that idea. And uh, the way in which I define work in the book and the object of that first pro proposition is. Uh, paid labor essentially or paid employment um, so a, a set of skills or activities that are performed for the purposes of receiving some kind of economic reward either immediately or prospectively and it, one way of thinking about this is that at least according to my understanding of it work isn't really an activity per se it's not defined as a set of specific activities work is rather a condition under which activities are performed, namely the condition of economic reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's that form of work that I'm focused on in mm -hmm. the book. Yes, because maybe when people hear about the end of work, they might associate it with people being lazy or not doing anything with their lives, right? But uh, I mean, what we are aspiring to in this case, in terms of eliminating the sort of work you describe through automation, is simply to perhaps liberate people from certain types of occupations that might be even damaging to their own well-being. Right. Right. Yeah. So, like, I think that's correct. I mean, there's a little bit of a... Uh, of an overlap between concepts here. So like when people talk about the automation of work, that does oftentimes spring to mind the, the concept of a leisure society. Mm -hmm. And I think when people talk about leisure or think about leisure, they instantly go to the notion of passivity and laziness. But I think, and I would hope that it's reasonably clear in the book that I'm not arguing for a world in which people are lazy and do nothing. Um, it's, it's a different conception of, of what a, a post-work society is. And th that's one reason why I, I actually avoid using the term leisure yeah. in, the, um, in, the, in the book. Or, or I, well, I don't completely avoid it, but I, I don't s describe the uh, form of post-work society in terms of leisure. So like, there are other people who do this. You may have heard of the concept of you know, fully automated... Um, in a communist leisure society, those people who leisure communism is what people refer to, and like that's not what I'm arguing for in the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you refer to communism, and I guess that uh, I mean the word leisure specific, specifically when it comes to from communist authors. I mean, it's a bit tricky. Sometimes it is associated with what they call the bourgeoisie, right? That is the class mm. of people that can go without uh, doing any sort of productive work and they can simply reap the benefits of the work that the rest of society does. But on the other end, there's also that utopian notion of we arriving at a certain point via technological development in a very advanced way where people would eventually not really have to do uh, anything at least to survive right yeah and i suppose like what i'm talking about in the book is not that is similar to that that vision i mean you're right in the sense that just as we say work is a modern invention and that's mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is a lot of people would also say that leisure, the concept of leisure, is kind of a modern invention as well. Um, and also, yes, it's true that the, the notion of a leisure class is often um, bound up with notions of people who are per parasitic on other workers, who exploit other workers, who are rentiers in the economy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so you do have this kind of paradoxical approach to leisure in communist literature as well as both the leisure class being the enemy and leisure being an, an invention of an industrial capitalist society, but then also people who argue that some kind of perfected communist society would have an ideal form of leisure within it. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I guess that there are two different issues that we have to talk about here in regards to work. One of them is 
the working conditions for the vast majority of people nowadays on the one hand and then on mm -hmm. the other hand uh, I mean there's also the issue of technological unemployment that is an issue that people have been putting a lot on the table recently particularly because of the development of advanced systems of AI and other types of technology but uh, le let's start with this second one because technological unemployment as an idea as a somewhat very long history at least since the first wave of industrialization and in the book you talk even about the Luddite fallacy and things like that so I mean uh, when you look at the data what is your idea about that do you think that there are really a lot of jobs that are under risk of uh, I mean, that people who work in them are under risk of unemployment in the short or medium term or, or not? Yeah, so uh, like I said, two things about that. Like, one is that historically it is very clearly true that machines have replaced certain forms of human labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, like the oft cited example here, maybe one of the most striking examples is the effect of mechanization on on agriculture um, you know I, I cite these figures in the book they come from this guy Max Roser he has this web page our world and data so he talks about the um, de agriculturalization of advanced economies in Europe and how you effectively have employment numbers going from over 50 percent of people being employed in agriculture not too long ago, 150, 200 years ago, to most European societies now, you have less than 5% of the population mm -hmm. employed in agriculture. You know, like you see similar effects in manufacturing industries. There's very clearly a displacement effect of technology on labor. Um, and one of the authors of one of the famous reports on the computerization of work, Carl Benedict Frey from Oxford, he's recently published a book called The Technology Trap from Princeton University Press, which actually goes through a lot of detailed examples of how machines have replaced human labor in the past. Okay, so it's, it's definitely true that machines replace human labor. What tends to happen is that people find other kinds of jobs. Uh, yeah. the, the economy creates other opportunities, other forms of work. Um, one way of thinking about this from a, a MIT economist called David Otter is to say that the, uh, machines, uh, mechanization basically have, and automation have two effects on work. They have a displacement effect, mm -hmm. so they push people out of certain kinds of work tasks, but they also have this so-called complementarity effect, which is that there are other kinds of work tasks that are complementary to the tasks that machines are good at, and humans can move into those complementary tasks. All right. Mm -hmm. So if, if you look at the current wave of automation in the workplaces, it's definitely threatening some kinds of tasks, you know, routine tasks that are performed in predictable environments, they are largely being automated. Okay, um, and I cite some of these studies in the book that talk about 40 to 50 percent of the tasks that people perform in, in the economy at the moment are capable of being automated, even with current kinds of technologies or very limited developments on this. So we're not talking about you know developing fully Android robots or that replace humans completely. Even with current technologies, we can probably replace those tasks. The question is, will humans find complementary tasks to those machines? So if machines are good at routine, predictable tasks, maybe humans are good at kind of complex, messier, more creative tasks. Maybe they're good at you know, social relations, um, you know, building relationships with clients, and machines can do the more routine back office stuff mm -hmm. in, in a workplace. Um, so that's that's the big question at the moment. And the assumption of most economists is that we won't see widespread technological unemployment. We will see displacement of some kinds of tasks, but people will migrate into these complementary tasks. Mm -hmm. But couldn't there be an issue when it comes to the kind of complementary tasks that we're talking about? Because it seems that over time, 
the complementary tasks will get more and more intellectually demanding because as we move from jobs that are probably more routine and man and manual to others that are i mean that are done together with uh, some sort of technology i mean it seems that the ones that have appeared and are the most successful nowadays have to do with for example computer programming and things like that that are really highly mm. intellectually demanding so what i'm trying to arrive at is if it will really be feasible to retrain a huge number of people to perform those kinds of uh, more intellectually demanding tasks that probably many of them won't be able to do uh, i'm not sure yeah. if that makes sense or not no it does um so like what one assumption and embedded in, in that question is that the kinds of complementary tasks that humans will be pushed into are the ones that are more intellectually demanding yeah. creative more complex um so that could be true and uh, that seems that that's one of the effects of technology at the moment. So like the people who benefit most from the current wave of automation tend to be people in these kind of creative, more cognitively complex jobs because they're the ones that are best placed to take advantage of the automation of more routine tasks, okay? So I, I'm, a, I'm an academic. I think some academics would claim that they are beneficiaries of automation in certain ways in their lives and that it you know, makes it much easier to do certain kinds of routine research work or data analysis and humans then are free to do more creative things like coming up with experimental designs and figuring out how to interpret them and apply them in different contexts and stuff like that. So that's that's one class of worker who might benefit from this. But there is also, I think, another effect here, and this is something that David Alter talks about in his work as well. He talks about the polarization effect that machines are having on the human um, labor market. So that some people are being pushed into these creative, intellectually demanding jobs, but there are lots of other people being pushed into actually more and more um, kind of slightly degrading and depressing manual jobs. So manual physical tasks that are performed in complex and unpredictable environments, machines at the moment are not very good at doing those kinds of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and people are being pushed into those as well. And Actually, it seems like more people are being pushed into them than are being pushed into the more creative and complex tasks. I mean, to go back to your question, though, about like, is it feasible to retrain people to go into these new forms of work? It's definitely not going to be feasible to retrain some people. You know, a, I don't know, a truck driver in their 60s who's replaced by a self-driving vehicle in the next 10 years is highly unlikely to be able to be retrained to become a computer programmer. I would imagine um, some of them maybe w could do so, but the vast majority won't be able to do so, would be my guess. And there's also another issue here, and so this is something I get into in the book, is that um, you got to think about a, the pace of, of improvement in technology as well here, okay? Yeah. So it's not just enough that there are other job opportunities for humans to be trained into. It has to be the case that humans can be trained into them faster than machines get better at performing those kinds of tasks. So if we're living in a world of accelerating improvements in technology, as some people claim, and these these don't have to be exponential improvements in technology, as some futurists would be kind of apt to, to focus on, as long as the improvements in AI and robotics are proceeding at a pace that is faster than we can retrain human workers, there's going to be a displacement effect. And like, there's also as well, I think, a significant issue here in terms of um, kind of institutional inertia and educational inertia in society. Is like, can we actually repurpose our educational institutions to train people into these new skills? I think that's much um, much easier said than done. So, like, one thing I cite in the book is a a report from the World Economic Forum on automation in the workplace, and they talk about how automation is going to displace something like 100 million jobs. I can't remember the exact figure, but that's okay because it'll also create opportunities for 150 million jobs. And it's just a question then of ensuring that our educational systems can train people into those new jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's like that's a very easy thing to say, but I think it's actually very difficult to imagine all the kind of policy changes 
and institutional changes that would be required to make that possible. Mm-hmm. Okay, because people who are currently employed as teachers wouldn't have the skills to train people into those jobs. So you'd have to kind of completely um, repurpose the system in a way that would be against the interests of people who are already entrenched in the system. And so I think, yeah, that would be a difficult thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, if, even if the technological un- unemployment doesn't have that big of an impact, we also have to take into account the kinds of jobs that most people are pushed into, right? Because, I mean, even if you have a very few number of people up there with highly paying jobs, like, for example, computer programmers and others, uh, I mean, nowadays it's the case that there are uh, more and more kinds of jobs like the ones from the so-called gig economy where yeah. where working conditions are really, really bad. I mean, uh, they have lo- uh, low wages. They uh, Sometimes they don't have any sort of benefits. Uh, and I mean, and even in terms of, of pro- prospects of retirement somewhere in the future, I mean, they are very low. So... Uh, that's another very important issue that we have to take into account here, right? Right. No, so I think that's correct. So this is one of the things I talk about in the book. So, you know, that first proposition that you described, I talk about how it's maybe possible to automate work, but it's also a desirable thing. And one of the reasons that I think it's desirable is that uh, the kinds of technologically induced change in the labor market that we're witnessing are forms of change that seem to be making jobs worse for many people. And one of the illustrations of this is what you just mentioned, the the rise of the gig economy. I mean, I frame it in different terms in the book. I talk about the rise of the fissured workplace. And this is a concept that I took from another author um, who wrote an entire book called The Fissured Workplace. Uh, it's just a, it's an interesting thesis about like how businesses have changed the way in which they operate through the course of the 20th and 21st centuries. So like very briefly, the history seems to be that sort of the middle part of the 20th century, okay, so you know, 1920 to 1970, let's say, that was the the rise of the big corporation, the big tent corporation where mm-hmm. you might have a company like Ford Motor Cars. They, their primary job is obviously to design and make cars for people to drive, but there's lots of other activities that are relevant to that. You know, they have to hire accountants, salespeople, they have to hire technical support, people they have to hire maybe gardeners for their corporate compounds or um, headquarters they they might have to hire security staff but they're all hired basically by the same organization or company they're all it under the same corporate umbrella and what happened really from the 1970s onwards is you got the fragmentation of those big corporations so instead of Ford employing everybody it might be relevant or tangentially relevant to their primary business mission, the idea is that they should just focus on their primary business mission and they should outsource all the other activities to independent contractors or smaller companies that specialize in providing security services or gardeners or payroll staff, that kind of thing. And one of the claims is that technology has made this fragmentation of the workplace easier because technology has enabled better kind of surveillance and monitoring of contractors, people who are contracted in to perform tasks on on behalf of the, the main corporation. And like there's quite a lot of evidence for the fissuring and fragmentation of the workplace, which I go through in, in the book. And the rise of the gig economy and also the rise of so-called you know, platform work like Uber, um, Deliveroo, I guess, would be another a good example. There are lots of other digital platforms that essentially you've got people who, who create a digital marketplace that links individual contractors, Mm -hmm. laborers together with people who want their services. Uh, So there there are these things for um, people who want to run experiments. Amazon's Mechanical Turk is a good illustration of this. Uh, People who want to design, uh, you know, go hire graphic designers, companies like 99designs, they, they all create these platforms that link together contractors. And the conditions of employment for these people on these platforms are most of the time much worse than they would have been if they were part of a a big tent organization. 
And th- th- just one reason for that, and then I'll shut up, is that um, the fragmentation of the workplace is good for certain people who have a um, an interest in what the corporation is doing. It's usually good for managers. It's good for shareholders because essentially what you're doing is once you outsource the labor, you're usually reducing costs in various ways. You're focusing on just the, the primary thing that contributes to your bottom line. Because again, if, if you're a company like Ford, gardening is just a cost. It's not a it's not something that makes profit for you. It's just a kind of nice extra that you have. Your your money comes from selling cars or designing cars. Anyway, um, so it's good for managers and shareholders. It's also usually t- good for consumers because it will reduce prices. Mm-hmm. But it's bad for workers. So the workers get the worst kind of deal in this fragmentation of the workplace. And so this is something that's just accelerating as a result of improvements in digital technology and surveillance technology as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's also connected with one of the other problems that you refer to in the book, that is the one of unhappiness and dissatisfaction, because there is a very high number of people, uh, workers out there, that are really profoundly unhappy and dissatisfied with their work and then that many times leads to uh, health issues, for example, and other kinds of issues that people have to deal with. And and so that would be another uh, another argument in favor of uh, the end of work somewhere in the future, at least if things continue falling down this route, right? Yeah, so uh, one of the things I talk about in the book are these uh, surveys that the polling company Gallup have been conducting for quite a number of years, these the state of the global workforce surveys that they interview a couple of hundred thousand people in pretty much every country around the world. And they have this 12 point questionnaire that they ask them about their work and what they're doing. And from that, they derive a score or a conclusion about how engaged and satisfied with work people are. Yeah. And, you know, the, the results of those surveys for the past decade or so have been surprisingly dispiriting to somebody who thinks that you know, uh, work is a, is a positive thing. Um, I think the, the global figure for 2017 was like 15 percent of workers around the world are actively engaged. And there's quite a lot, a lot of regional disparity. So Europe scores pretty badly. I think it's like 10% of workers in Europe are actively engaged and satisfied in the work that they do. Whereas in the USA, it's something like 33%. But even there, like that's about as high as it gets. You're talking about like in the 30s being the highest it gets. And I think, you know, this is partly speculation on my part, but I think that one of the main reasons for this dissatisfaction is that we have created a labor market in which People are increasingly anxious about the work that they do. They're they're forced to focus on it at all times. They're focused focusing on their employability, um, their desirability to potential employers or uh, contracting partners, and they have more precarious forms of work with less benefits. They're more worried about automation and displacement. And I guess you, at some point you have to ask the question: like, is is all this anxiety and competitiveness worth it and that's the question i'm asking in the book and suggested that it's it's not worth it if it's the case that we are kind of losing this race against the machines as well and probably that's also why some people at a certain point simply decide to drop out of the labor market altogether because i mean there, there are those people out there who decide to do that because they i guess they can no longer uh, take on the, those kinds of conditions right yeah i mean so there are quite a number of people who drop out of the workforce entirely i mean one thing that people are often surprised to learn when I discuss it with them is what the actual labor force participation rate is in most countries. So the labor force participation rate is a measure of the number of adults who are at work or actively seeking work as a percentage of the total adult population. Yeah. And it turns out that in most advanced industrial economies that that figure is somewhere between 60 to 70%. So it's already the case that 
there's quite a, a well, what I would say is a reasonably high percentage of adults who don't work and don't want to work or don't look actively seek work or look for work. Um, now, you know, some of them are doing that just temporarily. Mm-hmm. They're dropping out of work for a while for whatever reasons, family reasons. But there are some people who just can't cope with the pressures of the modern workplace and just find that they have to, to give up. Uh, if people are interested in this phenomenon, there's a very good book about it by a guy called David Frain. He wrote a book called The Refusal of Work mm-hmm. in 2015, which I cite a couple of times in, in my book. But he actually follows people who try to drop out of the workforce and the their kind of difficulties in life and discusses um, their motivations for doing so. And he has a number of his the people that he follows discuss this phenomenon of just feeling broken down by the system of work as well. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I, I mean, we've already went through some of the problems associated with working conditions and the labor market nowadays, and even also for the future, technological unemployment, working conditions, the fact that people are unhappy and some people even drop out altogether from work. So, I mean, one one propose, proposal that people have for all of those problems and also to try to tackle uh, economic inequality is the guaranteed minimum income or the universal basic income. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so this isn't something that I discuss in a whole lot of detail in the book because the way in which I frame it is that I think that if we bring about the end of work, Uh, there are two problems that we'll face. One is the deprivation problem, which is that, you know, will will the fruits of the automated workplace be shared equally? And will people have an income to pay for things that they need? If uh, if we're going to continue with some system of money and some system of monetary exchange where people are going to need an income, and are they going to get it? Uh, So that's one important question. That's a big question that a lot of people have addressed over the years, been a number of good books, I think, on the basic income guarantee and its benefits. I mean, overall, I am a fan of the basic income uh, as a proposal. Um, my view is that, you know, you, you have to have some way of redistributing income or wealth, let, let's say more generally, uh, if we're going to benefit from automation in the workplace. So you can't have a situation where you have 50 trillionaires who control the world's wealth and uh, everyone else suffering it's that's not that's you know the book is called automation and utopia that, that wouldn't be a utopian possibility i i can if you push me on it I, I might be a little bit agnostic about the precise mechanism that we use to redistribute income from the owners of capital and machines to the people who are losing out as a result of displacement I think the the basic income guarantee is is probably one of the best proposals that's on the table. And I think it is valuable for other kind of philosophical reasons as well that have nothing to do with automation. So um, I write, as you mentioned at the start, I write this blog called Philosophical Disquisitions. And I have a series up there, if people are interested, on the philosophy of the basic income guarantee and, you know, why it's, it's freedom promoting, because it means that you're not kind of looking for handouts from other people, that it gives you the ability to say no or refuse unpleasant forms of work or demeaning forms of labor if you want. It's, there's also, I think, a, a strong, or there can be a strong feminist case for the basic income guarantee as well as a way of kind of recognizing and protecting uh, women from some of the negative features of, of the, the capitalist workplace. So I think there, there are reasons to favor a basic income guarantee that have nothing to do with automation per se. I think the threat of automation is just another reason to to like the the proposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I also asked you about that because UBI is being taken seriously, at least in in certain parts of the world. Like, for example, recently Finland ran an experiment on that. Uh, I think last year, Switzerland, uh, I mean, Swiss citizens uh, had a referendum to decide if they would have UBI or not there. And then you also have uh, in the US, Andrew Young as a presidential candidate who also proposes a form of UBI there. Also, 
um, is thinking about uh, in the long run about the problems surrounding technological unemployment and things like and retraining people to do other kinds of jobs that he thinks is unfeasible. So, I mean, that's the reason why I asked you that, because people are paying more and more attention to that kind of idea. So. Yeah, no, it's it's an idea that has become increasingly popular, certainly the past you know half decade. And there, as you mentioned, there have been a number of trials of it and so forth. And Andrew Yang is trying to get it as a an issue that people take seriously in the American presidential election. I, you know, I, I follow people who follow Yang and I follow Yang on, on Twitter. And there's an interesting phenomenon whereby he is kind of denied a voice or representation by quite a number of the mainstream media. Yeah. So he, like he's, he's frequently left out of discussions of the leading candidates of in the Democratic primary, even though he gets a higher percentage in a lot of the opinion polls than some of the lower ranked candidates like Cory Brooker or Amy Klobuchar, who are more mainstream. So it's just a, it's interesting that he's he's being denied that voice, or for some reason, I don't know if it's intentional or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's now move on to your second proposition in the book. And now it's about automation of life more generally outside of the context of work. And mm. uh, as far as I understand it, uh, you think that there could be some issues there, particularly regarding things like human flourishing and things like that. So could you tell us a little bit about the types of contexts or the types of aspects of human life that you are considering there? Yeah, so I mean, I, I have a longish discussion in the book about what human flourishing consists of. Um, I don't say anything particularly radical or new there. I just really summarize a lot of the, the classical philosophical thinking on it. So, uh, you know, essentially philosophers are torn between two main schools of thought when it comes to human flourishing well being, just like purely subjectivist schools of thought, which say that your well being and your flourishing is determined essentially by how you feel about your life in some sense. Um, you know, there, there are more or less complex theories of that. You can have very simple sort of hedonic theories of well-being, and you can have slightly more complex theories of well-being that have to do with um, preference satisfaction or projects, life projects and life plans and that kind of thing. Um, then there are like objectivist schools of thought, which is that, you no, know, in, in order to have a, a flourishing life, it's not just enough to feel good about yourself. You have to be doing things. Your life has to contribute in some way to things of objective value or objective worth. Um, so, you know, you, you have to make some kind of contribution to human knowledge or understanding. You have to produce works of art. You have to do good for other people, do moral works and that kind of thing. Um, and then, like, there are other schools of thought that focus on the combination of both things. That Okay, you need some kind of subjective satisfaction with the life that you have, and but then you also need to be doing things of objective value and worth. And yeah, I'm a little bit agnostic about which theory is correct, but I, I kind of favor these in-between theories that I think you need to be both subjectively happy and fulfilled and satisfied, but also be doing things of objective value. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, aren't there also theories out there that say that uh, first you have to strive for uh, doing something that is objectively good and then it is from that that you derive subjective well-being. Yeah, no, that's an important qualification. I mean, that's yeah, that, like that's the something that uh, a philosopher would kind of pick up on as being important uh, clarification here. So it's, yeah, it's not just an it's not just enough that you are subjectively happy and you're doing something of objective value, and there's no connection between the two things. There has to be some kind of connection between the two things, and there is a certain order of justification that is important so that you have to be satisfied by doing the thing of objective value. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's a, that's a good point to, to make. And so then with that kind of rough map or understanding of what human flourishing consists of, uh, stipulated or set out, the question then becomes like, how does the rise of automating technologies like AI and robotics threaten that? model of human flourishing and understanding. And I talk about a number of different ways that it would seem to threaten that model of, of human flourishing in the book. I, like I have five arguments for thinking we should be worried about the automation of life in general. 
in, in the book. So just outside of work and the work-related tasks, if we start automating more and more aspects of our everyday lives, what's going to happen to us? Um, you know, one obvious thing that's going to happen to us, which I talk about in the book, is that automation always tends to involve some degree of outsourcing of cognition or labor or whatever to a machine. Mm-hmm. And if it's the case that in order to have a flourishing life, you have to make some kind of contribution to something of objective value, there's a danger that the use of automating technologies severs that connection between your activities and the thing of objective value so that you you can no longer be said to have achieved the thing that gives your life kind of meaning and purpose. And that would be something that would seem to undermine or potentially undermine human flourishing. And that, and that seems to me to be kind of built into the very essence of what an automating technology is, is that it always severs that connection or attenuates that connection to some degree. So what people will argue in response to that is they'll say, well, okay, it might attenuate that connection to some degree, but that will free you up to do other things of objective value. And so that then becomes a question of like, will we find these other things of objective value to, to, to find purpose and to live lives that are flourishing and full of well-being? And I would question whether that's going to happen because uh, to go back to one of your earlier points, you know, th- there might be an innate human tendency towards laziness and automated technologies can kind of capitalize on this bias towards laziness and um, make it less and less likely that we do the things that give our lives some kind of meaning or purpose. Mm-hmm. So it would probably be somewhat problematic if technology would replace us uh, when it comes to some aspects outside of the context of work. I mean, for, uh, th- there are people, for example, that say that if uh, work was completely replaced or human workers were completely replaced by some sort of technology, uh, even if people didn't have to work, th- they would probably find some meaning uh, in doing, for example, voluntary work or in establishing meaningful relationships with other people for which they would have even more time available. Uh, I mean, those kinds of things, right? Uh, so so uh, th- th- those are the topics that you are worried about here, right? If technology also interferes with that. Yeah, and so it, it could interfere with that in, in different ways, right? So. You know, I, I don't think that automating technologies will undermine our capacity to form relationships with other human beings that will give us some kind of uh, meaning or add, add value to our lives. But they might kind of distract us from those possibilities. Cool. So, you know, one idea is that if, if life, if automating technologies reach a point of of like near perfection where life becomes very convenient and you, you can get all the kind of entertainment and distraction you desire from one end of the day to the next without stepping foot outside your door, then you, you might never go out and do these charitable works or, or, uh, that give value to your life. You may never form relationships with, with other people. Uh, like one of the ways in which I, I frame this in the book, uh, and it is partly satirical, is this movie Wally, which people might be familiar. It's a Pixar movie from, I think, 2008, somewhere around then, which has this what I think is one of the most ingenious depictions of the automated future in it, where you have all these robots that do pretty much everything on behalf of humans, and humans, they're on the, they're living on these spaceships for reasons of um, ecological disaster, because they've destroyed the planet and they have to migrate off planet. Um, and all the humans float around this ship on these chairs, they're grossly obese and fat. They're fed fast food, and you know they have these TV screens in front of them that just feed them junky entertainment all day as well. And so they they've kind of completely blissed out of life. And that's one way in which the automated future, I think, could pan out. Even if that's an extreme possibility, there are certain features of the way in which automation is seeping into our lives now that. Um, Kind of are pushing us in that direction, and I think that would be something that would 
compromise human flourishing. I mean, your, your other point as well about the charitable work and yeah. you're doing voluntary work that benefits other people. Yeah, so some people would say that the automation of work will free us up to do those kinds of things and that'll add value to our lives. But it might also be the case that um, automated technologies are just better than us at performing some kinds of charitable work. Okay, so I mean, just to think about this in, in one sense, if you are a, um, a very staunch, let's say, effective altruist or something, that you know you want to give your money just to the best causes, yeah. um, you know, do you have, you don't yourself have the time to evaluate the best causes. So what, what most people do at the moment is they rely on these charity evaluators to do the, the work for you. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, at the moment, there are people within those charity evaluators that are going through the data and checking to see how good they are. But in, you know, in the future, it could be that you have automated checking of, of charities to see how, how good they are. And basically, you kind of automate the entire chain of decision making. So that at most, all you decide is that I want to do charity. I want to be a good person. I'm going to click a button, and this machine will decide exactly how to distribute any income I have or whatever the, it might be to make the world a better place. And I don't really have to do anything. So you could get the same kind of problem with automation seeping into these voluntary activities or charitable activities as well, I think. I, I think it's particularly true for any any contribution you might like to make to solving a moral problem that has to do with the distribution of goods and services. Yeah. It seems to me that uh, that is susceptible to automation as well. Mm -hmm. So this is also a matter of decision making that is of us um, for 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 fitting our need to uh, being ourselves making the decisions and giving that to some sort of uh, some sort of uh, artificial intelligence and we and then we don't understand the processes that are going on there. It's like a black box, right? So that that's the kind of problem that you're also pointing to. Right? Yeah, so I think there are actually two separate problems there that you're, you're describing, okay? So th th there's a problem here with whether the choices I make are truly my own, like whether I'm, whether I'm the one who's really making the difference or whether things are being decided for me by others. And in, in to put it in a more philosophical terms, like does does the rise of automating technology undermine my autonomy, my capacity for autonomous decision making? And so I think that is an issue because you've got you've got technologies that basically nudge you or manipulate you or tell you what you ought to be doing, and you can exercise some kind of choices over the information and the options that are being fed to you by technology, but sometimes you can't really exercise that that judgment. Um, I mean, there's a reason we can go into it as to why that might be the case. But then there's another problem here, which has to do with the opacity of these technological systems, that they're complex, they're difficult for humans to decode. What some people say is that, you know, AI lives inside these black boxes, that it does things that we don't fully understand. It's not transparent or explainable to humans. And so that means that we, we have less understanding of what is happening in the world. So things happen that are good and that make the world a better place. The, a, the the charity algorithm decides how your money should be allocated, but you don't actually really know why. You just have to kind of trust the system itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a bad thing because actually understanding the world, understanding what you're doing, uh, how you're situated within the world and how your actions make a difference to the world is also a key part of human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and then, I mean, the last two propositions, I guess, have to do with different forms of us creating a sort of symbiotic relationship with uh, new technology. Uh, the third one is about a cyborg utopia. Uh, I mean, cyborg is basically we merging with the technology or acquiring technological parts that work better than our own bodies or something like that. I mean, what are some of the issues that you are worried about with that kind of approach of us turning into cyborgs? Yeah, I mean, so like before I answer that question, I'm, I'm going to say something that, I, like I've said in pretty much every interview I've done on, on the book. Um, so I, I, I doubt people watch multiple versions of them or listen to multiple versions of them. But in case they do, they'll have heard me say this before, which is that 
so the second half of the book is about the kind of utopian possibilities with technology. But I set up those utopian possibilities in a certain way by trying to diagnose what the problem is with automating technologies at the moment. And so what I say is like the problem with automating technologies at the moment is that they threaten human cognitive dominance. That like one of the things that humans are good at is using their intelligence to solve problems, either individually or collectively. What seems to be happening now is that machines are getting better at certain forms of intelligent problem solving. Okay, this could be narrow in its nature, narrow AI, not not general AI, let's say, but still, it's still a threat to cognitive dominance in certain areas, and so that leaves us with a, I guess, a fundamental existential question for the future is like, what do we want to do in light of this? Do we want to try and maintain our cognitive dominance? Yeah. And to me, that means that we've got to find some way to make ourselves more like the machines that are replacing us. And so that's this idea of the cyborg utopia that I discuss in the book. Or we do something else, we kind of allow the machines to, to take over the world of intelligence and cognition, and, and, and we are doing something else with our time. And that's this other option that I discussed in the book of the virtual utopia. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in terms of the cyborg utopia, like, oh, what am I worried about with the cyborg utopia? Um, I, first of all, I would say that, you know, I, I try in, to make a decent argument on behalf of cyborgization in the book. I, I tried to point out why I think it could be a good thing or a positive thing for humanity and that it could be part of a what I think is a genuinely utopian project. I think it is problematic in a few different ways, uh, particularly in light of the kind of thesis of my book. Like one way in which it's problematic is that I think if we try to become more cyborg-like, we're, we're likely to exacerbate many of the worst features of the current labor market. So we're Effectively, you're going to, at the moment, let's say, in order to be employable, you have to, you know, go through many years of primary, secondary, and tertiary education. You have to go through different training courses. You have to have lots of internships and odd jobs to prove that you are a valuable worker. If we double down on cyborgization, what we're going to do is we're probably going to add a pressure to make yourself more like a machine to the mix, okay? Yeah. Um, so it kind of adds that competitive dynamic of, of work. So you'll have to be a, a cyborg worker, not just a, a, a regular human worker. Yeah. Also, I would point out, like, the concept of a cyborg is a little bit fuzzy as to what that really means. Because there are philosophers who say that we are natural-born cyborgs and you know, we've always been cyborgs because humans have always been living with these kind of highly symbiotic relationships with technology. Mm -hmm. And so the vision that people have in mind when they think about a cyborg is oftentimes a, a science fiction image of, you know, like the, the Terminator or something, or somebody who has technological components grafted into their biological components. Yeah, and like, probably they're thinking about some sort of enhancement, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but enhancement all in that is integrated, I think, into biological systems in some way. Mm -hmm. But you know, some people argue that just relying on external technology results in a kind of cyborgization. So if I have a highly interdependent relationship with my smartphone, where I rely on it for many cognitive tasks like memory, so you know, I don't remember phone numbers anymore, I don't know how to get from A to B anymore, I have to rely on Google Maps. You know, people will say, I'm, a, I'm sort of like a cyborg, right? Mm -hmm. And if you take on that definition of cyborgization, then it's probably already the case that many workers are cyborgs. Okay, so a worker in an Amazon warehouse who uses an algorithm to plot their way around the warehouse to fulfill customer orders, they're a cyborg worker. An Uber driver who relies on the Uber app to tell them where to go and who to pick up and how to receive payment is a kind of cyborg worker. And of course, one of, like one of the arguments in the earlier part of the book that we were discussing is that these kinds of cyborgization are oftentimes the things that are making work much worse for people because they're making it more precarious and they're resulting in this this rise of platform work and the gig economy and so forth and this polarization effect as well. So that like that's one, I think, major concern you could have about cyborgization. Um, I mean, there's other concerns, I think, about like the timeline of cyborgization. Are we going to be able to cyborg, turn into cyborgs that are better than machines Mm -hmm. um, in time to avoid kind of 
being replaced by machines. This is essentially the, like the same argument that we had earlier about can we rechain all our workers yeah. to become better than the machines that are replacing them? Can we actually improve the technology of cyborgization fast enough that we don't get replaced by, by machines? And I think you, that's open to doubt as well. Um, another argument here is that I think there are risks. If, if you go down the, the route of trying to graft technology into biological systems, there's questions about how safe that is, what effect it has on personal identity. You know, will these implants actually hold? Um, will they be as functional as what they were replacing? So there are those kinds of practical ethical risks. Uh, there are other things that I discuss in the book as well, like there's kind of more philosophical concerns about if we did actually become cyborgs, what kind of life would we live? Would it be a recognizably human life? Mm -hmm. It's like one, one thing I suggest when we think about utopian possibilities for the future is that they have to be in some sense relatable. You know, so, so, so if the future is that we're, we're all living as beams of light floating around in the cosmos, like that's the, what that's what the post human human future is that we turn into pure information with no embodiment whatsoever, as some people would argue might happen. I think you know somebody like Ray Kurzweil may argue that that's what should happen in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that is relatable for us right now, and that's important in the sense that I don't know if we can actually meaningfully evaluate that possible future and say that it is something that's positive for us. So there are certain forms of cyborgization that might be just, just so completely alien from the way in which life is currently constitu constituted that we just can't really meaningfully evaluate them. And so that could be another problem with it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're worried about some proposals coming from transhumanists, right? Like, for example, even when they propose certain ways to try to become immortal because that completely changes what human life and the human condition is about, correct? Uh, yeah, so, like, I'm, I'm not somebody who is opposed to the idea of life extension, per se. And so, you know, I, look, some transhumanists would, would frame their, their case for enhanced longevity in, in, in the idea that they just want to end the notion of involuntary death. So everyone gets to pick and choose the time that they die. Yeah. And I think that that is, um, that's not a, to me, that doesn't seem like a bad goal or, and tr like trying to greatly elongate human lifespans doesn't strike me as a, a bad thing. I do think there are certain problems that arise at the limit. So like if you talk about a genuinely immortal existence where you never die and you just live indefinitely, I think that is problematic. Uh, so, like, one reason why it's problematic is that it seems that at the at the very end of it, uh, this is, oh, sorry, since there is no end, that's a meaningless way of putting it. So, um, at a certain point in time, in a, in a mortal existence, um, your life would become kind of weightless and meaningless. Okay, and this could happen for a, a couple of reasons. One argument is that, you know, some degree of scarcity is important to what we value. So, like, the reason why things are valuable is because there's an opportunity of cost associated with the choices that we make. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and th that's what kind of adds significance to the choices that you're making. If you could constantly rewind the clock on your life, if you could live a perpetual Groundhog Day kind of existence where you're just repeating the same choices over and over again... Um, there would be a weightlessness to your decision making that mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't mean anything. You could just, you always have the opportunity to go back and change it and do something else. Yeah. So I think that would be a, a problem with um, a kind of a, a purely immortal existence. Mm -hmm. and another problem with it as well is that it, I think it would also undermine the notion of achievement. And so, like, this is not an argument that I came up with, but it's an argument by a philosopher called Aaron Smuts who says that there, there are essentially two options if you live forever. Either you either you achieve everything that it is possible to achieve, mm -hmm. in which case you, you kind of run out of things to do, yeah. or it turns out that there are some things that you would like to achieve that are impossible to achieve, and they're just going to be a source of perpetual frustration for you. 
And so again, at at the limit, this indefinite existence wouldn't be very meaningful. But but that doesn't mean that I'm opposed to the idea of okay. uh, longevity or uh, trying to um, reduce the possibility of um, involuntary death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and maybe just that, for example, if some people decided to live forever, literally, then that could probably raise some philosophical questions as to the value and min- uh, and meaning of their lives. Yeah, I mean, there's another, this is a slightly more practical concern about people who, who want to live forever is that because they're so terrified of, of dying and they want to avoid the risk of death, that means they actually have to limit their options in ways that means that maybe they can't live flourishing lives in, in various mm-hmm. senses um, because they're so risk averse, you know, and so that, that could be an issue as well. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the last proposition that has to do with the virtual utopia. So, uh, first of all, maybe a a definition. What do you mean by a virtual world in this case? Is it something like the kinds of things that we already experience, like, for example, when we are on social media or when we play a game online with other people? Uh, are you are you referring to things like immersive virtual reality or even at the extreme something like a Nozix experience machine where we would be plugged into it and I mean and basically our brains would be fed in a way that we would uh, we would genuinely think that what we were experiencing in our brains would be reality itself i, I mean what do you mean exactly there yeah so like this is a good question and this is one of those those questions that i think it's impossible to answer in a fully satisfactory way and that and the reason for that is i think that the the notion that there is some clear conceptual distinction between that which is virtual and that which is real is um it it's not not correct like it, there isn't actually this easy distinction between the virtual and the real so i mean like to give the the example that you had initially there let's say of um social of being on social media and referring to that as like maybe a kind of virtual communication or a virtual interaction with other people like i think that's wrong it's it's a digitized interaction it's an actual and through a technological interface it's it's mediated through technology but there's nothing unreal about the kinds of, of conversations that you have with people on twitter all right yeah it, it might be insulated from certain normal social consequences like if you have if you were talking to somebody face to face you know there might be a richness to that interaction that is lacking in, in twitter but that again that doesn't mean that the interaction that you have on twitter is not real okay and also, even at the extreme level of something like the Nozick experience machine, where you're plugging into this immersive virtual reality, uh, and it's so convincing that you think it's real, well, it's also going to be the case that many real things will happen to you in that world. Okay, so it's going to be the case that um, you will have real relationships with people in that world. You'll have real experiences. You know, you will, depending on how it's structured, you might develop real skills. You um, might experience kind of a real sense of mastery or satisfaction over what you're doing. So yeah, the, the, the notion that we can kind of easily distinguish between things that are virtual and real, I think is, is wrong. And so like what I do in the book instead is to try and offer an alternative way of thinking about the virtual and, and the real. Okay, so, and the way in which I frame it is that I, I say there, there are two conceptions of what is virtual and what is real. Um, that we can look at. One is what I would call the stereotypical understanding of virtual reality, which is that the one you kind of mentioned, which is that virtual reality is this immersive digital computer generated simulation that we live inside, like the Matrix or like the holodeck on Star Trek or something along those lines. Yeah. Or there's an alternative view, which I think is more counterintuitive, which is that actually virtual reality is a feature of our everyday lives already okay that we you don't need to live inside a computer simulation to live a virtual life 
And like one argument I would make is that for as long as human civilization has existed, we have been trying to make our existence more and more virtual. All right, in the sense that we are, we've been trying to build up a layer of um, both kind of a, an imagined socially constructed reality, mm-hmm. but and also a technologically um, constructed reality that insulates us from many of the effects of the quote unquote real world. Okay, so what I would argue is that at the moment you and I don't live in the real world, so to speak, we live in a virtually constructed or technologically constructed world. You know, I don't, I don't sleep in a, in a ditch or in a field. I live inside a house with artificial lighting, computers, walls, insulation, all the perks of modern life. So I, I've built up these layers between myself and, and the real world that most animals live in, let's say. Okay. Um, and I also have my, my experience of the world is mediated through a lot of socially constructed and imagined concepts and institutions as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, like a, a good example of this, probably the most popular example is something like money. You know, money isn't a, this is contentious, but what, what I would argue is that money isn't a real thing. It's a, it's a socially constructed thing, mm-hmm. right? The yeah, I mean, the fact that we decide to give some sort of value to a piece of paper, I mean, that yeah. is socially constructed, right? Yeah, and so, like, certain kinds of social relationships are also socially constructed, like like marriage, is a, I would say, is a social construction. Um, it's, a, it's not something that is inherent in the natural state, and, like, people often know this themselves, and that if they're in long-term relationships, they'll say it's, like, and then they suddenly get married, there's no real difference in terms of their day-to-day lives, but they've added this kind of social fiction to their lives as well, okay? So once you take on board that idea of a um, this more kind of counterintuitive definition of virtual reality where humans already live, in a sense, in a virtually constructed world, and we have been kind of increasing the level of virtuality of our world over time, I think this uh, makes the notion of a, a virtual utopia that I describe in the book um, more palatable and plausible, right? Because I think the initial reaction that people will have to the, the notion of a virtual utopia, which I do defend and think is a good idea in the book, is that, oh, this is, no, I don't like this idea. This is too kind of weird. I don't want to live inside a simulation. Um, but once, if they are kind of, can be brought around to the, the claim that I'm making that it's already the case that a lot of their lives are virtual, Mm -hmm. then I think this becomes a more plausible notion. So, I mean, in in philosophical terms, what I would say is that I'm I'm making a kind of a deflationist case for virtual virtual utopia, Mm -hmm. is that I'm I'm making it sound less different from our current Mm -hmm. reality than it actually is. There is, however, like one subtle distinction, or one important distinction between... um, our current reality and, and the virtual world that I imagine. Okay. And so this distinction is that a virtually constructed world is, is one in which the actions that you perform and the things that you do are insulated from or disconnected from certain kinds of consequences. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, part of what I mean here is that the actions that you perform have an intrinsic significance and value to them, but they don't have a kind of a longer instrument term instrumental purpose or value to them. And so one way of thinking about this is to think about the concept of a, of a game. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, like, I don't know how much you want to get into this, but uh, essentially what I argue for in the book is that the virtual utopia is a utopia of games in which our, all our lives consist of games essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, regarding that bit about games, since you refer to uh, cultural constructs that we create and technological ones and things like that as virtual, I mean, even things like social norms and legal systems and institutions that regulate how we interact with other people in our societies, couldn't that be also an analogy to a sort of game that we are playing? 
Yeah, I, I, so I think in many times that is true, okay? And that's um, the kind of social normative framework that we put on our lives. We create a game that yeah. you have to live by. The, the problem with the kinds of games that we construct at the moment is that um, we don't insulate people from certain negative consequences of failing at the game. So, sure. so there are people who would already argue that work as it is structured in the modern world is a kind of game. Right? There's a, a good example of this is a guy called David Graeber wrote a book called Bullshit Jobs where he talks about how most jobs in the modern economy are pointless and bullshit and people realize it. But the problem is that it, it's if you don't want to play the game, it has sort of deadly serious consequences for you and that you won't be able to survive. Right? So, so the, that to me is the the crucial distinction between the virtual utopia that I imagine and our current world. So, so you could indeed argue that our current world is consists of these virtually constructed games, but if you lose those games or you fail at those games, oftentimes it has very serious consequences for you personally and for your family and so forth. So the virtual utopia that I'm imagining is one in which those consequences don't arise because we live in a, a world of kind of technological abundance where we don't need to suffer from the deprivations of of losing our jobs or so forth. Those those concerns just drop out, and we can pick and choose whatever games we want to play mm -hmm. um, as we see fit. So again, one of the problems with our current reality, uh, our current world, even if it does consist of these games, is that there's a limited set of the games that we can play, and we're kind of pushed into playing certain games against our will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so m maybe this will be my last question. In, in terms of this virtual utopia, I mean, are you, the kind of virtual utopia you're referring to, is it uh, something uh, that has to do with us expanding our societies at a technological level even further and basically creating uh, even more technological advanced environments or does it really entail that people are plugged into some sort of device that makes them live in a, in a virtual world like in a computer simulation or something like that yeah so so if you if you accept the the definition or understanding of a virtual world that I've been trying to, to outline, and I, like I accept it's not a straightforward thing to, to get, then what I would say is that it could be either of those things. So, so it, like it, there's, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessitate any particular kind of... of um, like, so let me just put it in the way that I put it in the book. What, what I say in the book is that my conception of a virtual utopia is technologically agnostic so it's 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 agnostic as to the the form of technological infrastructure you might need to implement it so it could be one in which you live inside a virtual simulation it could be one in which uh, we get like far more advanced technologies but it could also be one that's lived in a kind of a, a real physical world that we're familiar with as well you know um so what, what's crucial to me is that we're we're playing games and the way in which we play these games is insulated from certain kinds of negative consequence or instrumental consequence of, of, of failure within the game, or even actually instrumental benefit within the game. That's another feature of my account as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so whatever the kind of approach we have, it's basically about avoiding people suffering the at least the worst consequences that they might suffer in the kinds of socio cultural political environments that we inhabit nowadays yeah exactly and but and just like one thing i would say is that which we haven't really touched upon in, in this discussion is that yeah. in addition to kind of identifying threats of automating technologies i also have a a longish discussion of what a utopian world would look like and one of the things I mentioned in that discussion is that I think a utopian world has to have some kind of expanding horizon of possibility, whatever that looks like. So um, it, I don't think it can be the case that in this virtual utopia, we all just play the same kinds of games over and over again. It, there has to be some kind of growth within that virtual world too to make it an interesting one and one that we 
won't grow tired of over time. Mm -hmm. And do you think then that it could be customizable for each person? I mean, particularly if it would be a, some sort of computer simulation, then maybe it could be tailored for each person or at least each kind of person with a set of personality traits or preferences or something like that for them to live in the kind of world that would fulfill their needs and, and or something like that yeah so like it could be personally customizable um like you do run into other problems if you have a perfectly customizable world and like there's so it turns out that that if you say that everybody should be allowed to customize their own game, their own virtual world to meet their own preferences, that might fall foul of certain kinds of, of objectivist theories of what flourishing consists of, because that means that people mightn't develop certain kinds of capacities or virtues. So that's that's one issue with it. And then there's another issue with it. It's, uh, it means that certain kinds of worlds are still conceptually impossible. So, you know, can my virtual world be one in which I can uh, murder you, for example. So that's that's the kind of world I want to create. I want to live in that world. Well, you know, probably not. There are probably there. I, I should say probably not. I should say definitely not, because um, there are going to be moral or normative constraints on the kinds of virtual world we c we can construct. At least like, that's what I would argue uh, for in 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 my view. And, like that's a problem that I discussed to some extent in the towards the very end of the book. Um, but like, so if people create their own virtual worlds, what if they want to convert everybody else to their mm -hmm. preferred conception of a virtual world, or or they want to invade and take over other people's virtual utopias? How do you deal with that problem? That's something that I I think we we would need to deal with, and so there do need to be moral limits on the kinds of personalized world that people can construct. Mm -hmm. but, but is that because you think that in those kinds of virtual worlds the people or the characters we would interact with with chorus would correspond to real people i mean they would be moral patients in some way people we would have to be morally pre preoccupied with or i mean could they, could they be just, for example, simulations created by a computer or some sort of AI? And if they weren't really sentient beings, then would, would there be any sort of problem if people simply decided that, okay, so I want a world where I can kill people uh, at ease, for example? Yeah, so I mean, if my, if my virtual utopia is just a simulation of me, uh, murdering you over and over again or something is that acceptable so because it's it's not i'm not really doing anything to you i'm sorry to pick you yeah. you as an example um but you know <laughs> yeah. to, to take it away from from you and to make this maybe less uncomfortable like this is the kind of world that we see in a tv show like westworld so for for example okay so it's, it's essentially a playground of immorality where people can and murder and rape these um artificial beings as they as they please and so, so yeah, th like that's one of the major objections to the virtual utopia that I describe in the book. I talk about the concern that virtual utopias become playgrounds of immorality. Like I have a, I have a longer set of views about the ethics of, of video games and the ethics of interactions with robots and others. So, like to give you a very quick conclusion on it, I think there are moral objections to you. Um, murdering a simulation of a person, um, irrespective of whether that person is a a patient, a moral patient or not. Obviously, like the the moral constraints become even more severe and more restrictive. I think if you're dealing with a moral subject of some kind, but I think there are constraints, uh, even if it's a just a a simulation uh, that has no sentience or can't be harmed by the interaction. And that's partly because I have this pretty strong like virtue ethical view that mm -hmm. there there was something in that that would compromise and undermine your moral virtue and being morally virtuous is part of what it means to live a a flourishing life as well mm -hmm. so it's because it could it could have some negative consequences on your moral character yes yeah like so 
consequences on your moral character is that would be the important qualification there. It's not necessarily that it has consequences for how you interact with other people. So it's, it's not. My concern is not so much that it would make you more likely to murder other people or do something harmful to other people. My concern is more of what it does to you and your individual moral character. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, we've already discussed, I guess, the major topics on your yeah. book. Is, is there something else that you would like to talk about, about any of the topics that we've explored or some final message that you would like to leave? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, so I don't know if I have a final message. I think we, we've definitely touched upon all the major themes and ideas within the book, which has been great. I, I mean, the one exception is, I suppose, the, the chapter on utopianism and what it actually would mean to construct and build a utopian world. And uh, I guess the only thing I would say is that there's a lot more kind of detail in, in the book itself. Um, and one thing that I, I hope is clear is that even, even though I have somewhat strong opinions and views on each topic that I address, and I, I defend the four propositions that you, you mentioned earlier on, um, I, I hope that what I'm doing in the book is that I'm trying to be fair and rigorous in the way in which I evaluate different arguments. And so that even if you disagree with the conclusions that I reach, I, I try to outline the case I'm making for each of them with sufficient clarity that it's easy to maybe locate the points of disagreement w uh, with what I'm saying. And so I'm, I'm kind of trying to model an approach to thinking about the future and what is a valuable, what is a valuable future that uh, other people can copy or um, criticize as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so John, before we go, um, I will leave a link to your book in the description box of the interview. I really loved it, so I recommend it to all my listeners and viewers. Thank uh, you. But, but where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, look, I guess two places. One is Twitter. I'm fairly active on Twitter. I'm at John Danaher. Um, so that, there are other John Danahers on Twitter. There's a very famous... Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor with my name, and I have nothing to do with that. Sorry to disappoint people. And then the other place is my blog, which you mentioned earlier on, which has a long title uh, called Philosophical Disquisitions, mm -hmm. which you correctly pronounced at the outset of this. And you'd be, you'd be amazed the number of times people have not got the name of it correct. So I thank you for that, um, which you can just find it by typing that into a a search engine and you can also I, you can provide a link to it maybe in, in the show notes as well if that that's easier for people to find it but th so those are the two places to find me mm -hmm. yes i will include that in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out if they're interested and so i mean again thank you for taking the time to come on the show and i really loved the conversation so yeah no i enjoyed this a lot as well it was great thank you so much Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Jane Heninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jakob Klinkby, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart. My three producers is our web, Rosie and Jim Frank, and my executive producer, Mikal Ruzieski. Thank you for all.